Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, activists running for Congress. How do they do it? Pramila Jayapal is a state senator from Washington State. She's been running for Congress all year. Chase Iron Eyes, one of the Native American activists coming out of the Standing Rock Sioux Nation, he's running for Congress in North Dakota. All that coming up right here on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Welcome to the show. We are big believers on The Laura Flanders Show in social movement activists running for office at whatever level. We're also believers in truth in political advertising. So I need to tell you right now that I support the candidate we're about to talk to, and I've even written her a check. A small one, but nonetheless, in the interest of full disclosure, I am supporting our next guest in her run for Congress. I've known her for a long time. Pramila Jayapal is a state senator in the state of Washington, and she is running for Congress for the Washington 7th District. She's a longtime activist. You will hear, particularly on the issue of immigrant rights and policing that is fair. She's been a big backer of the $15 an hour wages movement and a whole lot more. Pramila, I'm thrilled to have you here and I'm thrilled you're running for office, although I do wonder why you're doing it because <laughs> that it is must the big be question. hell. <laughs> Well, it's great to be on with you, and thank you for having me on, and thank you for bringing up so many of the conversations we need to have in this country. Well, we're meeting as very strange things are happening in New York. Talk a little bit about this period that we're in and those years when I think you first came to my attention soon after 9-11. Fifteen years ago, I ended up starting what is now called One America, the largest immigrant advocacy organization in Washington state. But it started off as Hate Free Zone, and it was really a response to the hate crimes after 9-11 against Arabs, Muslims, and South Asians, and the discrimination that was happening on a repeated basis. Within a week, however, what we realized is that this wasn't just about individual hate crimes against other individuals. It was actually about the Bush administration, civil liberties abuses, and illegal detentions, deportations, many of the things that were happening where Arab and Muslim men were getting secretly detained. We were fighting a big deportation case. We actually sued the Bush administration successfully and won and stopped uh, around 4,000 deportations across the country of mm -hmm. Somalis who were going to be deported back. And it was was the beginning, I think, of the movement to really understand what happens in those times of hysteria. Certainly not the first time we had the internment of Japanese Americans. We saw that again after 9-11, and I've always said that fear and patriotism together yeah. are the best way to suppress dissent. Hate crimes against Muslims are at their highest level. Donald Trump is actively utilizing the fear of the other to try and divide us, to try and put hateful things out there. He says things that aren't true all the time. And people are buying into that. You know, it's a very easy place to go, I think, to be afraid of what somebody mm -hmm. else that you don't understand or you don't know is going to do to you. So we've been standing up. I've been standing up for 15 years for the rights and civil liberties of everybody in this country and the diversity that makes the country so great. Well, so if people will have gotten by this point a little sense of your engagement with social movements and your social movement work, what has driven you at this point to decide to run for Congress, which is a very different kettle of it, fish? It is. Well, I think for me, after really 25 years of, of being an activist and an organizer, you know, that work at One America went on. We, we organized tens of thousands of people for immigration reform. We were working constantly with Congress on immigration reform, on stopping SB 1070 and terrible laws that were passed in Arizona, elsewhere. I realized that I had spent all this time trying to get other people to do the things that we thought that they should do, and that there really needed to be more of us in office, that there needed to be more movement activists in office, that it's not enough just to take a good vote or to stand up against bad things, but we really can expect a lot more mm. from utilizing the platform of elected office for organizing. And so I decided to run for the state Senate and, um, in 2014, and I won. I'm the only woman of color there. I'm the first South Asian American woman ever elected to the state legislature. And I got a lot of things done. I also learned a lot about what the barriers and the challenges are. And like as what? A, well, I think that there is not a lot of organizing on the inside. People really act as individuals. They don't act as collectives. And I'm used to acting in a collective way in the movement. 
But that's because nobody is really doing that organizing and trying to build that. And I shouldn't say nobody, but very few. I think that there are structural ways that the system is set up where you are expected to play a certain role if you're in a caucus. And that makes it very difficult sometimes for people to take on their own caucus members who are not doing the right thing. And in my very first year in the state Senate, a couple of Democrats in my caucus introduced a bill to roll back all of our payday lending protections that we had implemented a couple of years ago. We have some of the best paid, we're still not perfect, but we have some of the best restrictions in the country. So I stood up and introduced 87 amendments to kill that bill against a Democratic caucus member. And it was, um, challenging, but we killed it. And I think that there are ways in which seniority, hierarchy, the way things are structured, it depends on how much money you give to the caucus, what committees you get. Well, isn't um, that all going to be just worse in Congress? It will be, but I'm seeing ways, and I'm a fixer, Laura. You know, I hate looking at something and complaining about it. I really feel like if there's enough to complain about regularly, then I should go try yeah. to do something yeah. about it. You wrote a piece in The Nation um, that you were a state senator not afraid to talk about race. What was your argument? My argument was that we have to start talking about institutionalized racism, that we have to look at the structures and the policies that we're passing, and that we have to take it on even when it feels uncomfortable. And it's particularly difficult, I think, for people of color because it always falls to us to, to talk about race. You sometimes risk the idea that the only thing you can talk about is race, when in fact, I know a lot about transportation, finance, small business, minimum wage, the economy, jobs, all these You're different a mom, things. A woman. I'm a mom, I'm a woman, and I, and I say that actually, that you know, I'm not a, a woman on Monday, a mother on Tuesday, a worker on Wednesday, an immigrant on Thursday. I'm all of those things all of the time. And so for me, when I look at any piece of legislation, I think about women, people of color, those who are most disadvantaged, how is it going to affect those people? And I think that we need to do that more mm -hmm. in office and we need to not be afraid to say the words race. You say the word race or racism and there is a hushed silence and everybody looks at you like, uh-oh, what's going to happen yeah. now? On uh, Dr. King's birthday, I introduce the resolution every, every year for Dr. King's birthday in the state senate because I have the most diverse district in the state. This last year, I talked about the killings by police officers of, of black and brown men in particular. And afterwards, there was a whole contingent of African-American ministers who came up to me and said, that is the first time we've ever heard that discussed mm -hmm. on the floor. And I said, I understand why, because when you start doing that, all of law enforcement comes out. People say, are you against law enforcement? So you have to do it in a way that allows you to raise the questions, but you know, also recognizes that we've got work to do. We can't shame and blame. We have to bring people into the conversation. You also introduced a resolution around immigration and welcoming immigrants, and that stirred up quite a hornet's nest. Re refugees. It was, a, oh. it, was a, it was a resolution to honor Washington State's historical role in welcoming refugees, going back to the Vietnamese refugees and to say we continue to be a welcoming state because when the Syrian refugee crisis was happening, our governor, very proud of him for this, he came out, he wrote a piece in the New York Times and he said, while all these other governors are saying we don't want the Syrians, we in Washington state welcome the Syrian refugees. And we are an excellent state for, for immigrant and refugee rights, partly because of the work that we've done over the years. I decided it was time for us to be reminded of who we were as a state. So I introduced a, a resolution honoring our role. It was a bipartisan, it talked about the Republican governor who was there when we brought Vietnamese refugees in. It actually was quite beautiful. I, you know, there was a Republican woman on the other side of the aisle who never speaks on mm. resolutions. She comes from Eastern Washington and very conservative district. And she got up and to my great surprise said, when I heard Senator Jaipal talking about all of the things that refugees go, to, go through to come to this country, she said, I realized that I needed to stand up and talk. My sister-in-law is Muslim and I have gone to a mosque for the first time. It was really quite yeah. wonderful. There was a little line in the resolution that said, we honor our you know, Muslim families that come. They're our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors. Well, we passed the resolution and then we went into our caucuses, our respective caucuses, and we were supposed to be back on the floor for votes. 
Three and a half hours later, we were not voting, and it turns out that the Republican caucus had blown up over the resolution because some people in that caucus thought that I was introducing a resolution to endorse Sharia because it said Muslim. So these are the things that we're 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 fighting all the time. So to bring our audience up to date, you were in a nine-way primary. What happened? I won with 42% of the vote. I doubled my closest opponent who got 21%. Um, I won just about every legislative, state legislative district within the congressional district, and we stand very well poised. Now, we are a top two state in Washington, as you know, and so the Wait, top two mean? vote-getters mm-hmm. go on. So it's not a partisan primary. So in other words, you don't have a Republican against a Democrat in the general election. Unfortunately, otherwise I would be done. But <laughs> it is two Democrats running against each other for the general, and I feel very good about winning. And who are you up against? A guy I named Brady Walkinshaw. He's a 31-year-old legislator. We feel like I've, I bring the experience, the confidence, the results, the movement building, track record, and really have been tested in the fire. And I think when you go to Congress, you don't know what's going to come up. We never knew that 9 11 was going to happen. We don't know what is right there in front of us. And we need people whose values are clear, who have led from that place of deep conviction and generosity and abundance, and also people who are ready to take on issues, particularly in our district, one of the most progressive districts in the country. We need somebody who who can take the experiments and innovations of Seattle to the United Mm. States Congress. And I was on the committee to raise the $15 minimum wage, really proud of that work. I was one of the first leaders on the Safe, sick and, uh, safe and Sick Days ordinance that we passed in Seattle. We just passed a scheduling ordinance in Seattle. We are at the forefront yeah. of really redefining what the economy should and can look like. And I think that we also are at the forefront of a political transformation. One of the things I love about your campaign, and I should issue an invitation to Brady, should he be in New York, it's hard for us to travel, but we'd be happy to talk to you too. One of the things I love about your campaign is how on the ground it is. Sure, yeah. you're doing media like this, but you're also knocking on a whole lot of doors and you're training people to yes. do that work, something yes. that I wrote about and, and studied a lot when I was doing that book, Blue Grit. What are you hearing when you knock on those doors? This has been the most amazing part for me all Always, as an organizer, you know, we knocked on something like 70,000 doors during the primary. We made over 140,000 phone calls. And I feel like it's it's a couple of things. One is you hear directly from people what they're thinking about. My organizing director, who's from El Salvador, likes to say, we're breaking what has become mainstream American yeah. culture. <laughs> because we are going to somebody's door, and they're actually telling us what is most important to them. So what is that? People feel that the economy is rigged against them. They feel that because it's true. They can't afford housing. They're working full-time jobs, but they're not getting paid enough. They are terrified about how they're going to finance their kids' education because they don't see a future for their kids. Young people feel like we're going to graduate $40,000 in debt. That's the average debt that a young person has. And it's not worth it. So we're actually driving people away from higher education instead of towards higher education. Retirees feel like they can't count on Social Security because of the conversations around Social Security. And fear? The fears you talked about at the beginning? You know, we don't see voters having the kind of fears that Donald Trump is trying to stir up as much. We really see people worried about themselves. And so the extent to which you can help folks understand that we're all better off when we're all better off and remind people of their generational history because everybody was an immigrant at some time or another except for our Native Americans and African Americans who were brought over unwillingly. But a lot of people understand that their history is rooted in immigration. And so in our district, we are fortunate in the 7th Congressional District to have a very progressive district where people understand that the values that Donald Trump is putting out there are not the values. And the real problem is we've got to take on these big corporate interests, fossil fuel companies who are blocking climate change, you know, big banks who are profiting from student loans. Those kinds of things are what they mm. are thinking about is where's the opportunity for the average person. We're seeing a rise in violence against Muslim Americans yeah. and immigrants in general across the country in the context of this election campaign. You can try to draw a direct line. Maybe it's not so easy, but that's that's certainly been the fact of what we're seeing. Are you experiencing any of that? We get that a lot, but it certainly has seen an increase. You know, we get You're calls to our state office. Yeah, I'm used to this after 9-11 in particular. I got a lot of death threats, lynching threats. Um, I still get people constantly at me on social media yeah. in different ways, particularly when I do anything national saying, you know, go back to to your own country and why are you soiling our earth and in much 
worse language. That is absolutely there. Recently, my legislative aide, who's from Bangladesh, her mother got a phone call, and it now seems to be happening to a number of people, where Trump supporters are calling and mocking and threatening on the phone. They're getting a personal home number calling this elderly Muslim woman who is now terrified. Mm. That is what we're seeing out there, and I think it is, you know, hate crimes against Muslim Americans are at the highest level, even beyond se post-September 11th. Yeah. And there is no question in my mind that this is Trump allowing for something to be acceptable. Kind of unleashed. Well, that goes to whatever happens in November, the general election, the presidential election. Well, you'll be in Congress, of course. But the raw materials of which that Trump upsurge has been made will remain, if you can yeah. follow my grammar. Yes. Um, which is to say, the work isn't over. The no. problems are still there. That legacy is still there. What do you do right after the election? kind of regardless of whether yeah. you win or not. Well, I think the first thing is, uh, is uh, just to back it up a little bit, is how important it is that we have everybody voting for Hillary Clinton. I um, just think that's incredibly important. I was an early supporter of Bernie Sanders. He was an endorser of mine. But this is not a situation where we can afford to have people allowing Trump to get more yeah. votes in the total. and. And I really think that when you look at the two candidates and you see what Donald Trump is going to do to this country, there is no comparison in my mind. We I'm even had Ralph Nader on the other day saying, if you're not going to vote for Hillary, at least persuade a Trump voter not to vote for Trump. Not to too. vote for Trump. I just think that this is absolutely critical that we defeat Trump dramatically, not divided amongst many parties, but we defeat yeah. him decisively because for people across this country, and certainly people like me, immigrant women of color, Muslims that are out there, we cannot afford to have people thinking that it's close, that he got close, that this is actually acceptable for the United States of America. After the election, day after the election, we're going to continue to fight for um, this progressive platform that we've laid out. Expanded reproductive rights for everybody, the ability for women to, to make choices over their own body, expanded Social Security and Medicare, scrapping the cap, fighting for a, a $15 minimum wage across the country, making sure that we have affordable child care, fighting for climate change and taking on the fossil fuel giants. All of that requires building movements, in my belief. It's not one person that's going to get it done. It's all of us. You can see why I have a soft spot for Pramila Jayapal. <laughs>
that is living in separate worlds. There's a fear, a misunderstanding, and an apprehension about what it means for 3,000 natives to gather in protest of a pipeline. I mentioned it to the governor to try to reach an honest and peaceable solution. He said he'd be willing to do that, but since that discussion, all they've done is call for more federal dollars to up the security and replenish the money that was spent. It's created a situation where we have to do our best not to fall into those lines of division that are being drawn in a way that positions lawful, tax-paying National Guardsmen against a group of unlawful protesters. If you read some of the comments coming out in the mainstream North Dakota media, you can see that narrative developing because they're pushing it so hard. Because they've declared a state of emergency, because they've called out the National Guard and activated them, because there are military-style roadblocks, it creates an atmosphere of apprehension. We need to really work hard to make sure that bridges are built after this thing is done because we are all North Dakota, we are all Americans, but right now I don't think tribal nations perspectives are being respected at all. It's been a test, it's been a blessing and a curse, but anybody who wants to be a leader should not shy away from any of the real issues that confront you know, our leadership, our constituency, and our society. Politicians are not leaders. Politicians answer to their donors, whereas leaders answer either to their own spirit or to the people that they want to represent. is highly possible this election will be a glass ceiling breaker. Our question from the start has been, what is that going to mean for the whole house? Well, a few weeks ago in a conversation with culture critic Jeff Chang, I quoted someone with a few things to say about that. Anna Julia Cooper. Born into slavery, graduate of Oberlin College and the Sorbonne in Paris, Cooper gave a lifetime of speeches, one line of one of which appears in today's U.S. passports. Check it out. She's the only woman whose words appear. Because the whole of that Cooper speech is so relevant to where we are now, here's some more of it. From 1893, the Congress of Representative Women. Let woman's claim be as broad in the concrete as in the abstract. We take our stand on the solidarity of humanity, the oneness of life, and the unnaturalness and injustice of all special favoritisms, whether of sex, race, country, or condition. If one link of the chain be broken, the chain is broken, said Cooper. A bridge is no stronger than its weakest part, and a cause is no worthier than its weakest element. She continued, lest of all can women's cause afford to decry the weak. We want then as toilers of the universal triumph of justice and human rights to go to our homes from this Congress demanding an entrance, not through a gateway for ourselves, our race, our sex, or our sect, but a grand highway for humanity. Anna Julia Cooper continued, the colored woman, as she put it, feels that woman's cause is one and universal, and that not till the image of God, whether in Parian or in Ebony, is sacred and inviolable, not till race, color, sex, and condition are seen as the accidents and not the substance of life, not till the universal title of humanity to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is conceded to be inalienable to all, not till then, is women's lesson taught and woman's cause won. Not the white woman's, nor the black woman's, nor the red woman's, but the cause of every man and of every woman who has writhed silently 
under a mighty wrong. Thank you, Anna Julia Cooper, Hillary Clinton, and all your crew. I hope you're listening.